Well, you may be seated. And uh, we're, we're coming up on that time of year where uh, three and a half days from now, millions upon millions upon millions of people are going to do that one thing that we always do at the beginning of every year, write out our New Year's resolutions. Yay! Got to love that. You know, it's, it's, it's a list that millions of people write out, but maybe a handful of people actually get past the first week. How many of y'all have actually gotten past the first week of, of we have one, that's the first person I've ever met that has actually gotten past the first week, you know, but it's, it's, it's generally a lot of, you know, easy stuff that we put on the list, you know, stuff like, you know, we're going to watch what we eat, we're going to take care of our sugar intake and starch intake and blah, 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 all the evils of processed food, right? And then a week comes by and McDonald's is right there and yay, Savior, we, we, we're, we're in there eating. Um, but see, let me ask you a few questions before before we get started here, and in, in the spirit of, of eating healthy, how many of y'all hate asparagus? Ooh, wow. How many of y'all hate beets and broccoli? A couple people. Let's flip it on the other side. How many of y'all just hate ice cream and cake and sweets in general? All right, we got a, like one or two hands. We had a lot of hands in the first service. All right. How many of y'all just hate raising your hand? Fair enough. Well, let's get, off the, let's get off the diet plate right here. Let's go into a little bit of a personal question. How many of y'all hate the University of Alabama Crimson Tide? Man, hands went up. Okay, let's flip it. How many of y'all hate the Auburn Tigers? Golly. A little bit of, yeah. Anybody hate LSU? <laughs> the one LSU fan. Dang it. All right. All right, let's go pro. How about the Dallas Cowboys? Oy. Man, you were in here the last... So, okay, forget it. We're going to work on you, Eric. Um, how about, does anybody hate the way the United States government's being run? Anybody hate Jane Fonda? So. Well, let's, let's go, let's see. Let's go back to that, that New Year's uh, resolution. Strangely, a lot of those lists lean towards physical improvements or, or hopeful accomplishments, what we'd like to get done this year. And in three and a half you know, days, millions of people are going to write down that they are going to lose weight, that they are going to quit smoking, get a better job, save money, start recycling, get fit, be less stressed, and take a well-deserved vacation to a warm tropical paradise that isn't a two-and-a-half-day trip to a Motel 6 in Panama City Beach. <laughs> Amen. But see, changing our lives is what we desire to do most, but I, I fear that uh, we're only trying to change the things that we can see physically. And we're not trying to look at the things that are actually destroying us internally. So if you would, turn to 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 through 21. If you're using our Bibles in the, uh, the chair backs or under your seat, it is on page 864. If you're using your own Bible, surprisingly, 1 John is right before 2 John. So. And, and while you're going there, let me ask you a couple of questions. I want you to ponder uh, while we're, we're going through this message. Do you have any hate in your heart? Is there an inkling of hate in your heart? Or where's the love? Maybe you should ask yourself that. Where's the love? If some of y'all didn't raise your hands, uh, either because you either sensed a trap, um, you didn't want to admit it, or it's true, you don't like raising your hands. But I would venture to say that there's a trigger word somewhere in your heart, somewhere within you, that if we were to say it right now, your blood pressure would just go sky high. Or if somebody were to walk in here that you have a problem with, I guarantee you something would happen. So I want you all to think about that as we move through the sermon this morning. So here we go. Uh, I actually need these. Chapter 4, verse 19 through 21. Here we go. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Now, we just read that we love because he first loved us. And that means that any love that we show, any love that we feel, is only possible because God loves us. So if we love our spouse, it's only because God loves us. If we love our friends, our family, hot dogs and butterflies, it's because God loved us first. And we also know this because it is written that God is what? God is love. 
And if, if, we're, if we're able to love because God first loved us, and God is love, and it brings us to our first point, and I want you really to drive this home in your heart, is that not only does God love us, but God is the very love that loves us. And if you stop to think about that statement, that's actually a pretty deep statement. And hopefully you'll be able to walk away from this place with a a different image of who God is in your life. That not only does He love you, He's the love that loves you. He is the makeup of the very love that loves you. But if God is love and we're only able to love because God loved us first, then why is there hate? What is hate? I mean, obviously, we, you know, the simple answer, hate is the opposite of love, right? Well, that's just a little too simple. If hate's the opposite of love, according to our Bible, and God is love, then what is the opposite of God? It's not the devil. The devil is not the opposite of God, because in order for the devil to be the opposite of God, he would have to be an equal entity, equal powers, and he is not that. Because love and hate, they are the opposite of each other. So if the devil is not the opposite of God... God is love, opposite of love is hate. What is the opposite of God? No God. The opposite of God is is no God. Because if, if there's no love in one's heart, then there's no God in one's heart. If you have no love, then you do not what? You do not know God because God is love. Now, hate can come to us in many different forms, masks, hats, outfits, colors, and tastes. And there have been too many problems in this country with hate. We've, we've experienced it a lot, especially in this part of the country. Especially in this section of the country, we've dealt with something for centuries called racism. Racism is what? It is a hatred towards others of a different race, culture, color, or creed. This is an obvious hatred. It's easy to spot. And the Bible has plenty, i got to tell you, plenty to say about hating another person. One in particular comes to mind, 1 John 3.15, anybody who hates their brother or sister is a murderer. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. That's 1 John 3.15. So what is that saying? People, it says, if you hate a brother or a sister, then you are no better than someone who takes another person's life. A murderer. But Chad, come on. I mean, what if I just don't like someone? What then? I'm not telling you to build a summer home with them. You don't have to, you know, spend all sorts of time with every person in the world. But here's the thing that you've got to understand is you do not get to choose who a brother or a sister is to you. And if you don't know who a brother or a sister is to you, let me give you a clue. If they are a human being, they are a brother or sister to you. Because notice it didn't say in 1 John 3.15, if you hate another brother or sister in Christ... See, if that were the case, Christianity would have, would, have, would have been gone a long time ago because the Christians then would have been allowed to hate the ones who were not Christians and they wouldn't have let them in to become a Christian. If you hate a brother or a sister in Christ, think about that. Because some of us had been raised in a home where it was common to make racial slurs where it was common to outwardly hate someone. And, and that is something, if that's you, that is something that you are going to have to overcome. You're going to have to overcome it to where it no longer influences your heart. Because if you let hatred influence your heart, then then you are living a life on the wrong path. Plain and simple. If you hate somebody, you're wrong. Flat out. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Are Are you able to stop that? Absolutely. Stop hating them. It's It's really as simple as that. But you don't understand what they did to me. I don't care. What did we put God through? He still loves us. And that's deeper than what anybody could have ever done to you, no matter what it is. But it's easy to recognize some hate because of the way that people speak towards certain people or certain, certain people groups targeted with hatred. But what about the hatreds that are not so obvious? The ones we don't actually think is actually hate. What about, what about those things? That if, if I were to say one thing right now, it would, it would spark an excitement and an anger in a lot of us greater than any world war that has ever happened. 
And of course, I'm talking about the wide, wide world of college football. <laughs> I know, you're probably looking at me going, all right, you're getting nuts here. That's kind of stupid, Chad. What are you talking about? It's just a game. Well, yeah, for some of you. Some of you, I actually believe, but a lot of you, <laughs> I've sat with you during a game. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't believe you. Because I've known people to say that they hate Alabama or they hate Auburn or they hate all these teams and stuff. And I love, if you're ever in my youth group, you know what I'm talking about here. I love to pick on the people who say, I hate Alabama or I hate Auburn. Case in point, heard somebody say to me one time, I hate Alabama. I'm like, really? What did 52,419 square miles of the southeast United States ever do to you? Well, no, no, I'm, I'm talking about the University of Alabama. Oh, the school. Yes, the school. So you hate a learning institute. Interesting. Tell me about that. No, I don't hate a learning institute. The football team. Oh, the football team. Yes. Okay, so you hate 60, 18 to 21-year-old boys who play a game with a ball. Well, not when you put it that way. But see, I've read things and heard things in person that just that break my heart. I mean, most everybody in here, if you've ever followed college football, you know who Cam Newton is. Cam Newton plays uh, quarterback for the Carolina Panthers right now. And several weeks ago, he was in a car wreck. And I was reading that online, and I saw one of the quotes somebody had put there said, I hope that piece of Auburn filth dies. I, I was sitting with a friend of mine. We were watching ESPN one time, and uh, it was a Thursday, or getting ready for a Thursday night game. It was a Tuesday night, and they said such and such team is flying right now to, uh, to get ready for practice for this Thursday night game. And the guy turned around and said, I hope the plane crashes, just so we can win. How terrible a thing is it in order for someone to be happy that they, they wish death on a group, regardless if they're joking around or not? Because I've got to be honest with you, some people aren't joking. And there's plenty of people in here who remember what happened in 1970 when Marshall University lost a football team. 1970, they lost 37 football players, 8 coaches, 25 university boosters, and a 5-member flight crew. 75 lives. 75 families were affected. 44 years might be a long time for any of us to remember that, that pain, so let me just bring it home for you. How would you like to go through life knowing that someone else's happiness is dependent upon your gruesome death? That's what hate is. But Chad, we're just having fun. We don't mean those things. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. Because when the results of a game, and please understand me when I say game, fun, and the results of a game, does anything to incite hatred for another group? Then there's a serious problem, and that problem is with the person who has it. So if you have a hate towards a team, or a person, or a people group, the problem is you. Because you're allowing something in your heart that doesn't belong there. How many fights have happened because of sports? Let's get off of college sports. How many, how many fights between fans or friends have happened because of hatred be between the two groups? Man, I've seen it. Have you seen the videos on YouTube? Come on, how many parents are, have gotten into fights at Pee Wee League competitions? As entertaining as they are, it's stupid. Hate comes in forms and in many forms, and it's hard for us to see because we get caught up in the drama. We get caught up in the pomp and circumstance and loyalty of one side to the other. But what about the even more ridiculous sounding hatreds that are out there? I asked you earlier, how many of you hate asparagus and beets and broccoli and cake and ice cream and stuff like that? What about those things? Chad, you're starting to sound a little crazy here. I'm simply stating that I have a certain disdain for a certain food item, thus conveying my, to you in a dramatic way of how much I don't like it. Well, I get it. I really do, because beets, asparagus, and you know, cauliflower, they are low on my totem pole of food. You ever heard that phrase, beggars can't be choosers? Yeah, they can. I could be starving for seven days. You offer me beets, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm going to go eat some dirt, because that's what it tastes like to me. I just don't like beets. Heather, on the other hand, thinks they taste like candy. And Thank you. <laughs> 
I, I know it sounds a little crazy here, but the problem is not in the conveyance of what foods you hate as much as the words you're explaining it with. Because when you say, I hate, you are speaking words. Those words you speak have meaning. Those meanings you speak have direction towards something or someone. And the more comfortable you, have, you, you become saying that you hate someone or something, I believe the further and further and further you get away from love. Because it's easy to say you hate something when it doesn't, you don't prefer it to your liking. However, there's a certain group of people who are watching and listening to every single one of you. It's our kids. I can't tell you how many times in this church I've heard children, I've heard youth say, I hate him or I hate her, all because they disagreed with something. I hate you. Why? Because you don't like what I like. Well, that makes sense. Well, where did they learn that from? So the problem is that we're training our children to be liars. We read in verse 20, our second point today is that to love God but to hate men makes you a what? A liar. You can't love God and, and hate man. At least not according to his word. If you can figure out a way to do it, let me know. I'll post it on Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr and all those things. But I, I really don't think you're going to be able to do it. So why are you telling us this? I'm telling you this because you must know that love and hate cannot occupy the same space. Love and hate cannot occupy the same heart. You have God in your heart. You don't want hate in your heart. Love and hate cannot anymore occupy the same space than light and darkness and oil and water. It doesn't mix. They may exist somewhere on the same planet, but they don't exist together. So if you have love in your heart, you love God. Yes, absolutely. But if you have hate in your heart as well, then how is it that we're able to operate? As we heard earlier, if you hate your brother or your sister, you're a murderer. We just learned that we're a liar. People, just upon those things alone, please do not walk out of those doors the same that you were when you came in here. Especially if you have hate towards someone. Because coming from someone who's had a lot, a, a, a lot of dealings with hate is not worth it. It is not worth the condition of your soul. It is not worth the condition of your heart to hate. So what's the big deal about asparagus and Brussels sprouts? Nothing really. I mean, had somebody come up to me at the end of the, uh, the second service and say, so technically a hatred for Brussels sprouts, beets, and broccoli is kind of like a gateway hate, right? Like, yeah, it's a gateway hate. It's, it's something it's easy to hate, right? Yeah, but bec and, and, you know, am I making a big deal of this because of a disdain for broccoli? Yes, I am. Because of your disdain for broccoli, the dislike that you have for food is not the problem. It's the condition of your heart. The Bible says something like, as a man thinks in his heart, so is, so is he. So this means that what is in your heart is actually finally coming out of your mouth. Because honestly, how bad is it that we have to announce our hatred towards a vegetable? It's kind of ridiculous if you think about it. If you don't like beets, my goodness, don't eat them and change the way you think. Honestly. there would be more beets for my wife. She will love it. She will make all the beet things and all the beet juices and all that other stuff. We'll have a beet beet time at the Boswell house. If anybody brings beets to my house, I will. Uh, so. But the issue is not the feeling that you have towards food. The issue is how you garner in your heart hatred towards anything. Because if you allow hatred towards anything in your heart, guess what? It's not going to take long for you to hate something. And then something else. And then something else. And then someone. And then someone else. So perhaps the solution here is for you to mind what you say and how you think. Most of us probably grew up with our parents saying it's not a good, good thing to say hate. I can, I can vouch for that with my dad right here. It's not a good thing to say you hate something. Perhaps the solution here is to ask God to expose your heart so you can sift through the debris and finally come to God with a pure heart. Maybe the solution is to finally stop living a double life of, of love and hate at the same time. 
and maybe realizing that in our third and final point is that it is a command to love one another. It's not a suggestion. If you love God, then by command, according to the word that we just read, you have to love your brother and sister. It is not a suggestion. So, Chad, what you're saying is, as a Christian, I don't get to hate anything? Come on. I get to hate something, right? Yes. You get to hate something. One thing. Evil. That's it. The Bible says to abhor anything that is evil. That's as far as you get to go. So, what if somebody's evil? Can I hate them? No. You can hate the evil around them. You can hate the evil in them. But you cannot hate them. Jesus said to what? Our enemies. To love our enemies. Jesus didn't say you were allowed to have enemies. If you have an enemy, it's because somebody doesn't like you, not because you don't like somebody. Let me put it another way around. If you have an enemy, it's because somebody hates you, not because you hate someone else. You're not allowed to do that. You are allowed to have an enemy to do two things, to love and to bless them. That's it. You have an enemy, somebody who hates you, love them, pray for them, ask God to bless them. One, it'll drive them crazy. I hate you. I love you. (laughs) What? I've actually seen that happen before. Man, you're a jerk, but you're an awesome guy. Well, thank you. But see, he said not to allow, not to have any, we're not allowed to have any, 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 any enemies. Can you say that? Any enemies. We're not allowed to have any enemies to attack on our own unless we attack them with love and blessings. That's it. So if you are an enemy to somebody, meaning you don't like or you hate somebody, you're wrong. I'm not judging you. This is according to the Word of God. You hate somebody, you're wrong. Stop hating them. Love them. Bless them. Change your heart. Change the way you think. Change those you don't like by loving them. Love those who have done you wrong. Like I said, don't build a summer house with them. Don't go on vacation with them. Don't spend an incredible amount of time with everybody in the world, but... If a person is able to walk into the room and your blood pressure goes up, that's your blood boiling, not theirs. That's your temper rising, not theirs. That's your heart spewing venom, not theirs. So the best way you can hate evil is to stay away from it. There should be no room in your heart at all for hatred. If there's room in your heart for hatred, there's a problem. Because God is love and he wants your heart. (coughs) If there's room in your heart for hate, get ready to be called a liar. And not by me, but by God himself upon his word. So if you want to start the new year off right, then release everything you hate and show them some love. If you have hatred towards a person, then love them. Ask God to bless them. Forgive them for whatever they do to you, no matter what. If you have hatred towards a vegetable, don't eat them and get a life, people. (laughs) If you dare to proclaim Christ in your life, the first thing you have to do is get rid of, in your vocabulary and your heart, is hate. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. So when you write out these resolutions in the next three and a half days, don't focus on the things that are the obvious, cutting down on sugar. I learned a long time ago you can flex fat, so don't worry about, you know, Working out, you know. January 1st, I'm actually going to go and cancel my gym membership. (laughs) That's the first. But uh, just focus on the things that truthfully are destroying you internally. If you have hate, that's number one. If you don't have love, that's number two. Ask yourself these questions. Do I have hate in my heart? Where's the love? Think on those things.